Hey everybody, Tim Hanlon here. In this interview, I have the huge privilege of connecting with Brian Key, who's one of the pastors at Redeemer Fellowship right in the heart of Kansas City, Missouri. Brian helps us ground this conversation about race and ethnicity and reconciliation right in the meta narrative of the Bible. And what I also love about this conversation that I have with Brian is, uh, is that he helps us to go even deeper into what it can mean for us to participate in this whole conversation um, in reconciliation as both individuals and as a church. You do not want to miss this one. How's it going, Brian? Good, brother. How are you? Good, doing well. So this is uh, Brian Key, who is a pastor at Redeemer Fellowship in Kansas City, Missouri, right downtown in Kansas City. And uh, I had the privilege of participating in their church when we lived in Kansas City. And welcome, Brian. It's so nice to have you with us. Yeah, man. It's good to be with you, brother. So tell us, just to get to know you a little bit, what is, uh, what is your role at Redeemer Fellowship? And uh, what yeah. kind of things do you oversee there? Yeah, um, so I lead our preaching team. We have three congregations. Um, so I lead our preaching team across uh, those three congregations, coordinating our calendar and setting up our series and things like that. Um, I also lead our residency program. Mm -hmm. So we have a two year pastoral residency uh, that is designed to train ethnic minority pastors and church planters uh, to do kingdom work. Um, and so uh, I've been doing that for, I've been in that role for probably five years. Before that, I was a groups pastor and have been at Redeemer since we planted in 2008. So I've worn many hats, um, but those mm -hmm. are my current hats at the very least right now. Yeah. And what, tell us the vision of Redeemer. I, I love this vision. Yeah. That you yeah. I mean, like our, our mission is to cultivate communities of transformed disciples who live for the glory of God and the good of the city. So mm -hmm. at the heart of everything we do uh, is, is transformation, uh, helping people become worshipers of Jesus, committed disciples of Jesus who are able to share their faith and uh, multiply the life of Jesus everywhere that they go. So um, it's, it's a fun, fun thing to be a part of and an internal thing to be a part of, like the work we're doing um here and and work you're doing in longmont like it lasts forever so it's, it's really fun to be a part of it that's awesome brian yeah well and thank you so much for joining us um you know as we are you know as a church at calvary we are engaging uh, the conversation of race and reconciliation yeah. and uh and you know i've heard you uh preach and teach on this um many times and I think for all of us, like what's really important is to try to ground this kind of conversation in a meta narrative of the Bible. Yeah. Um, so help us to understand what would that actually look like to ground uh, racial reconciliation and justice yeah. in a biblical worldview? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I, I think the one of the one of the first things you have to do is understand what what the arc of the scriptures are doing like god is creating a dwelling place for people to dwell with him for him to be their god and for him them to be his people um all the way back in the garden and you see the garden in uh the new jerusalem the garden temple of the new jerusalem god has made a dwelling place to dwell with people from every nation forever so like from end to end it is about a God who creates a world uh, and invites people to dwell with him and to fellowship and commune with him. And what we gather um, in, in that narrative in Genesis 1 is that God creates mankind in his image. Um, and, and Paul takes that, that language over in, uh, from, from Genesis 1 over to Acts 17 and says that from, from, uh, from one man, every nation among mankind, uh, God brought into being. And so like there's a connectedness of all the nations already, just by virtue of our our uh, our descendants from from Adam himself. Mm -hmm. So you've got that, and then you, as you fast forward through the fall, which breaks relationships uh, between God and between man, you get God's promise to Abraham: Hey, I'm going to bless you through. I'm going to bless the nations through you. Like your seed is going to uh, bless the nations, and so you have the nation of Israel. Their purpose is to make the name of God known and to, to invite peoples from every nation to see God, see who he is, and uh, and have what, what you see in Isaiah 2, this, this moment of come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Like, let us learn from him. Um, that That's their vocation as the people of God. They fail in that, 
Um, and so you have you have Jesus coming and, and it's predicted even um, in Isaiah chapter 11, like God says, hey, a branch is going to come. He's going to draw the nations. And so like Christ comes onto the scene. He's lifted up. Um, lives the perfect sinless life, dies the death you and I deserve to die, is raised from the dead, and in his life, death, resurrection, um, he invites all of us into communion with God through the forgiveness that he purchased. And um, in that, the dividing wall of hostility is torn down, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, and in that, God creates a new humanity. So where all the hostilities uh, brought on by sin at the fall happen, um, Christ tears those down and invites us into a new community, a new family, um, as the nations get to know who their God is through this man, Jesus Christ. And the end of the story is such that um, he's drawing all of us together, um, every tribe, tongue, and nation, and people uh, in worship of the King, all singing salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb who sits on the throne. Like, that's our, that is our, um, uh, that that's the inevitability that we're that we're moving towards like god god will get his way and he will finish his work and so in some sense like though maybe culturally and maybe in in different moments in history that reconciling work seems like it won't happen like the one who speaks and makes promises um and always fulfills them he's going to get his work done um mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm grateful for that that gives me a ton of hope even where i'm prone to discouragement and despair at times yeah and so, and so, like, as we look at the landscape of, of our own country and even our own history, like, how do we take, as believers, how do we take that biblical narrative and apply it, like, into our current, into our current environment? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I think the, the, the first and foremost and primary thing that, that has to be done as Christians is our doctrine of humanity, mm -hmm. found in Genesis 1, 26, 27, is is just so rich that that human beings are created in the image of god um, there's inherent dignity and worth and so above everything else like human beings or christians at the very least those who hold a christian worldview should be able to look upon other people other other men and women and say image bearer image bearer image bearer there's something rich and inviting about another person's presence that is pointing you to the living god and so um anything that demeans that diminishes that denigrates that like we should be the kind of people who say man that, that's not right because that person is meant to show you who god is in some way some shape some form and so i think that that is one of the big things of it i think the other side of it is um is like i said we have a hope that keeps us from despair so in every place where we see divisions really highlighted everywhere we go um and, and the tribalism highlighted everywhere we go, like we actually have a hope that our God is going to win. Um, mm -hmm. He's going to he's going to finish his work. And that that I think should keep us in the work of naming the sin of racism and, 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 and things like that, where we see it and calling people towards the richness of fellowship that can be found in Christ and within the household of faith. Um, so we've got a ton of reason to hope. And um, I mean, there's one thing that's like, you think about, um, I, I talk about it this way, like um, in Christ, what, what Ephesians 2 invites us into is the soteriological reality of our one new humanity in Christ. Like it is, it is a reality in Jesus. And then what Revelation invites us into is an eschatological inevitability. Like the end, the end of the day, God is going to win. He's going to draw people together. Now, our work as Christians then is to say, hey, this soteriological reality is true. This eschatological inevitability is true. How do we live in the moment? Which I think the epistles are really helpful because like Paul says, talks all this rich stuff about our unity in Christ in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, and then spends Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 essentially saying, hey, here's what it's going to cost you, what it's going to look like to live in unity with Christ. And what we realize is that what Christ saved us into is actually in human experience really hard to live out, which is why we need all the grace that saved us to be applied afresh in repentance and confession and drawing near to one another over and over and over again while we wait on the day. That's awesome, Brian. I think I'm going to just take everything you said and take quote it really. verbatim. No, I'm just <laughs> Uh, with the messages that are coming up. Anyway, um, uh, is it, so, when, you know, a lot of times I've heard people say, um, you know, I mean, even across, you know, across my lifetime that this really is not a skin problem. 
mm-hmm. but it, but as, you know, but it's a, a sin problem. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you how do you think about that that kind of phrase? Yeah, I mean, I've, it absolutely is a sin problem. Um, there's there's no question about that. James is is very clear about um, the sin of partiality um, um, on on whatever basis we're partial to people. Like it it is absolutely at its core a sin problem. Um, it is a sin problem of saying, hey, what God has created is not beautiful. Like that's what racism does. Mm-hmm. Um, it says, hey, that that skin tone, that ethnicity that God made you um, is actually not beautiful. Um, and that that to, to call something evil that God has called good. Um, Isaiah, I just preached Isaiah 5 recently, like woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Like God's not pleased with that, you know? Um, and so it's, it is, it is a sin problem. Now, one of the things I push back with people on is like, yeah, it is a sin problem that actually directly is, um, pointed at my skin. Um, and so like there, the people, I think we try to separate them out in an effort to be theologically accurate and helpful, um, and, and point at the heart depth, but it actually is a thing that like people sin against me, for instance, on the basis of my skin color. Um, so it is a sin of partiality applied to a particular skin color or ethnicity. So mm-hmm. it's, it is a sin problem um, more than it is a skin problem, but that sin problem is pointed at my skin. That seems to be a problem to some people. <laughs> yeah. So in that sense, it's on the basis of, of something that is applied maybe to a specific type mm-hmm. of people or a specific right. color of people right. and yet not to another that's right. Group of people. And, and I'd love to ask you, Brian, like for you and, you know, in your experience of being black in America or African-American mm-hmm. America, yeah. um, like what has that been like for you? Yeah. I mean, yikes. Um, I've been doing this for, I've been around for 38 years. So <laughs> I've, had, I've had a few experiences. Um, man, I, I think like I've, I've, I grew up in a really small town in the South and um, a really great hometown in a number of ways. Like we had a really sweet church community that I was a part of. My my family grew up there. My mom and dad grew up there. But um, man, my, my hometown was like, I dealt with a lot of racism, um, racist words, racist actions. Um, I have friends get grounded because they were hanging out with me. I've had um, our fight song that I ran out to on Friday nights was uh, Dixie. <laughs> um, so like, I mean, you, you think about little things like that along the way of growing up. Um, all the way to, um, I remember when I got to college, um, I had an academic scholarship to University of Arkansas, um, but I got there and I was still in football shape um, from from playing ball in high school. And like the assumption from everyone I met my freshman year was like, oh, you came up to play ball, huh? It's like, no, nah, man, I, I didn't. Like, But a lot of black guys who were my build did go to Arkansas to play football. And so like, it was just assumed that like it was that way. Um, I've been pulled over a number of times and um, questioned like pretty heavily, car searched, like all that stuff like that. Not because I was doing anything illegal, um, but, but just just because um, I guess they needed something to do that day. I don't know. Um, I remember one one in particular. I was in college. Um, guy pulled me over and asked, I asked like, "You have weapons or contraband?" And I was like, "No, like I." <laughs> Was driving the speed limit down the highway, um, going home, and um, he, um, you know, he, it, we we talked, and he asked questions like, "Man, I see those Arkansas stickers. You know, you play ball up there." And I was like, "No, I don't. Um, I have a full ride, actually, academic scholarship." And I remember like he just stopped in that moment and was like, "Hey, you know what? Um, I'm going to tell the K9 unit, don't worry about coming. I'm just going to send you on your way." And it was like. Hey man, you didn't have to ruin my day um, because, like, you assume something. Now, like, I was wearing a hoodie and had a Yankees hat or toboggan or something like that on. So, like, and I was driving on a highway that was a known drug run. So, like, I don't know. Maybe I fit a description for him that day. Um, I've had a number of things like that um, over the years that have been really hard. Um, my wife is white. Um, so I remember when we started dating, the kind of looks we would get, um, just even walking through the mall um, in the town that we started dating. So it was like, I mean, little things like that um, along the way and some bigger, harder, uh, more sad conversations uh, have happened as well. So, 
Yeah. No, I'm sorry, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's just, you know, totally different, I think, from, from me and even my experience of, you know, of our own country. And, and even though I also, I mean, I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood, mm. but it just felt like I had a different experience almost completely wow. from wow. a lot of my friends wow. growing up. Yeah. And from you as well, you know, and I, and I think that's uh, what then ends up being maybe uh, challenging and, you know, for, for us as, uh, you know, white people, dominant culture. I mean, however yeah. we want to uh, talk yeah. about these things, what words we want to use um, is we feel we re- we're, I mean, at the heart of it, I feel, or we feel uncomfortable even engaging in these kinds of conversations, yeah. you know? Um, and uh, it feels political at times. Um, we want to be more hands off. Yeah. You know, we want our churches to be hands off and to kind of just assume that it's not there. Um, but like, you know, based on your meta narrative of scripture, like, mm-hmm. It's like we have, there's a mission in relation to this kind of, this issue. Yeah. And uh, at its heart, it's validating the image of God yeah. in all people. Yeah. And recognizing that we participate together mm-hmm. in that image of God. Um, right. So another thing that I often heard uh, is that maybe a solution to this whole conversation is that we become um, colorblind and just, you know, maybe stop talking about it. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? I mean, should we be colorblind and just think that everyone is yeah. the same? Or ha- I mean, how how would you say that? Think yeah, that. I mean, like it, that that one has always been really fascinating, a fascinating you know claim or something like that um, to make for people. And I think it's like if we actually take what God what God means when we talk about uh, being image bearers, like each one of us uniquely bear the image of God in a particular way, broken by sin kind of shattered and fragmented in all those ways, but still representative of something that God is inviting us to see about his world. And that means that in the way that God made you uh, and in the way that God made me, there's a particular thing he wants to reveal about himself to the world around us. Mm-hmm. And and part of that is just like, he made me a made me a black man from the South. Like, so there's, there is a, a sense in which like, and there's something about me um, with the, the curl of my hair with the color of like all of those things like that he that he is revealing about himself through me and 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 and, and so like from that standpoint it, it seems odd i think that we would want to be colorblind because there's something of a of a blessing that we would miss by not seeing the distinctions that god has given us because those distinctions actually show us something about himself like yeah. and so in in some sense like um one of our one of our pastors talks about it this way he says hey man like i'm i'm greedy uh, I'm greedy for the glory of God. And we're like, and he's like, you, it may be a weird thing to say, but like, I want to see and understand and know every bit of God's glory that I can. And one of the ways he's told me he's revealed his glory in the world is through other image bearers. I want to see every bit of his glory that I can um, through your faces, through your stories, through your culture, um, precisely because it points you back to God. So like, I think we miss blessings uh, by by trying to be colorblind, and I think it's it's also just dishonest to on the on the on the negative side. It's also just dishonest to um, like the 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 realities of the world that we live in. Because if I say I'm colorblind, that means everything is level, equal, no distinctions, no difficulties, no issues, and things like that. But that just doesn't make sense of the real world. Like there there are real um implications and real difficulties um in in certain places depending on 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 what your ethnicity is and so i think for us um it, we miss an opportunity by attempting to be colorblind not only to receive the blessing but also to like move towards brothers and sisters in compassion and lament mm-hmm. um, because man if you're telling me like on the basis of your ethnic makeup um you've experienced the world really differently. Well, Paul tells me to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and to weep with those who weep. So the invitation from God is not to dismiss that. The invitation is, how can I take your suffering and your difficulty into myself and weep tears with you and say, Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done and let me move in love towards this person where they feel neglected by by the world around them. So I think um, 
colorblindness keeps us from that reality and keeps us from moving into that particular form of blessing and, and being a part of the family with one another. Um, so yeah, that, 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 would, that, would, that would be one thing. And then as far as like not talking about it anymore, uh, the challenge I, I have uh, with people as I talk with that is like, hey, um, if you are suffering the brunt of a particular sin by, you know, another person, say, you, you know, your, your wife is sinning against you in a particular way, do you, do you quit talking about it? Or do you keep saying, hey, man, that hurts. Hey, that's sin. Like, that's what we do with every other sin. But, some, but like, there's something, I think, in within the American church some at times where um, I think because it's so overwhelming and because it's just so difficult to get our hands around, right? It's like, man, can we just quit talking about it? Maybe it'll go away. But, like, there's not a sin that ever goes away without being confessed and put to death, mm -hmm. confessed and repented of and put to death. Like, that's just the nature of what our souls are like. Yeah. Um, Those roots so, run very deep. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so, you, so you like, you confess the sin, you repent of it. You ask God for grace to help you to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. You lament where that sin affects someone else. Like you don't quit talking about hard things. In fact, the Bible gives us resources I think to continue talking about hard things and continue to move toward the grace of God where we need it and other brothers and sisters where we need to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I resonate deeply. I mean, the, the need to engage it and the need to, to experience, you know, the unique, I mean, oneness is not undermining of uniqueness, right? Right. right. I mean, and, and like for myself, like having, you know, had the privilege of living, you know, in various parts of the world you like i have seen god's glory manifest mm -hmm. in all these different contexts you That's know right. it's almost like the landscape you know we yeah. have the mountains and valleys and the yep. uh the hills as well as like the flatlands of america and it's like mm -hmm. you drive through america you see the beauty of america right? That's right and so when we interact with different people of different races we see the beauty of god That's, That's what right. i'm hearing you say man That's right. so and the and then um and then if it's a sin, like if, if, uh, if racism or ethnocentrism, if those are rooted in sin, then we need to identify it, you know, because like God wants to shine his light into dark places. So That's right. That's right. yeah, this is a, and it's a hard thing, obviously for us, because sure. so much of our identity is, is, uh, is tied up into this, especially as Americans, you know, and, and, and we love our country, you know, but we don't want to deny mm -hmm. uh, our, you know, some of our history. We don't yeah. want to deny that because that history might be very well alive. Well, and yeah. I mean, like, and the denial, right? Um, mm -hmm. To deny sin in my own life is to also deny myself an opportunity to receive the grace of God. Yeah. So, like, I mean, you think about that, like, I, God has immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards me to, in the age to come in Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 2, right? Well, like, I want as much of it as I can now. And, like, if confession of a sin gives me more of an opportunity to receive his grace. Like, I think as Christians, we should be like, hey, I want more grace. Can I have more right. grace? More, more grace? <laughs> like, and that connects, uh, that connects right into Ephesians 2. You know, by grace, you've been saved. Right. You know, from death, you know, raised together with Christ. And, yeah. and, and I think by grace, we've been saved from our hostility, mm -hmm. from the division, mm -hmm. from the dividing wall. I mean, he tears that down. Yeah. You know, and it's that same grace that, tears that down that also redeems us and makes us alive with Christ. Amen. And uh, so we need that grace and we need to, part you know, we need, you know, we experience more grace when we're honest. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. This is great. You know, we could go on for hours, but just <laughs> maybe one more, <laughs> one more question for you, Brian. Um, so we are a diverse church in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when you really think about the tapestry of peoples, you know, we mm -hmm. are a true melting pot. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, people from maybe almost, if not every country in the world live right here yeah. in our country yeah. and a large portion of those people, there are Christians represented in, in probably most of those races and ethnicities. Mm -hmm. Um, so what can unity, you know, what can re reconciliation maybe look like for us? And maybe what, what could a tangible step or maybe a couple steps look like for us you know if you could leave us with with man. like a couple things like what yeah. would that look like man i i oh golly 
Um, <laughs> lots of things. That's a, that's a massive question. Or you can I leave think, with with ten steps. That's fine. Yeah, right, yeah. I, mean, like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I even have helpful steps. I think one of the things that we desperately need um, in our country, in particular, um, Jesus' prayer for a unity in his in his church in John seventeen mm-hmm. is um, is really powerful. I had a chance to preach it um, mm-hmm. recently, um, and like, man, it was just blown away by the missional aspect of our understanding and living in unity in union with Christ and unity with one another. And I've been I've been seeing that same thing myself. Yeah. It's yeah. it's a marvel, man. And so like in some sense like I think we should be the kind of people who are constantly praying that like hey God in every place where sin is active in your church and keeping us from being the unified presence um, of uh, of god in this world like would you tear it down and would you would you help us to grow together in love with one another i think i think that like there's there's, here's why i start with prayer right um i think that um racism in our country is actually one of the places where where there's significant stronghold like significant like spiritual warfare and stronghold Mm -hmm. um in those places and i think we attempt with strategies of reading books and having conversations and discussions to like try to fix the problem and like what we're actually dealing with is a spiritual problem and and i I can make a biblical case for it because like you think about this acts 1 8 jesus says um says you'll 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 receive power from my spirit and you'll be witnesses in jerusalem judea samaria and to the ends of the earth and um so one uh, one scholar was talking about this, and he said, "Hey, man, what Jesus is inviting us into is that to see the gospel move in a way across ethnic lines, across cultural lines, in a way that draws us together is going to take nothing less than the power of God. Like it's not just a missional strategy. Jesus is saying, like, hey, it will take the power of my Spirit for these Jewish men and women who who know the gospel to move across lines of culture to take that gospel to other places, just like it will take." my black self to across a cultural line and i pastor a predominant, at a predominantly white church so like it takes it will require the spirit of god to take me across a line that human beings have said should be a dividing thing and a hostile thing it takes the spirit of god to like say you know i actually love these people like yeah, these are yeah. these are this is my family i actually love them and and the world tells me i shouldn't love them but christ gospel tells me i should love them we have um i remember preaching acts eight several years ago like we have a um a boundary crossing barrier destroying message of a boundary crossing and barrier destroying savior like that's awesome that that, that's that's what we have in the gospel and it takes the spirit of god to invite us and equip us in that work so i think we got to pray that god would unify his church pray that god would uh make us bold witnesses pray that god would make us courageous um I, i i think um there's fear in a lot of churches that like, man, if we talk about this, like what will our members think? What will people, what will donors think? That kind of a thing. And I was talking to a brother recently and I said, Hey man, righteousness always hurts. Hmm. Like pursuing the way of righteousness always hurts and people will leave, but we have to ask ourselves a question. Hey, what is the meta narrative of scripture pointing us to? What is God inviting us to? And it doesn't matter actually if I offend your sensibilities if I'm in line with the glory of God and in line with what God is doing in the world. Like if I, if you're offended because I offend your sensibilities, because I'm pointing at what God says I should point at and, and, and trying to run at that, then like that might be a reason for us to, to move on in, in fellowship and, and things like that. And I hate doing that, but like, I, I actually like, this is, this is my God book here. <laughs> like this, this is, this is the thing that, that guides me. And so righteousness hurts. I think your relationships, your dinner table, man, like, for me, uh, my wife and I love to cook meals for people and, and have people over. And it's an opportunity for me to share culture and share relational dynamics and share joy with people. Um, and dinner tables, like, bring down walls and bring down barriers with that's one right. another. Um, I've experienced that. We've experienced that ourselves at your house. I mean, that's yeah, like five, seven years ago or something. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, like, it, draw, it draws people together, draws stories out, draws passions out, draws all those things out. Yeah. So that's that's a that's a big thing that can be done. I think, man, praying for ethnic ethnically uh, diverse churches in your in your city too. Like, 
praying for uh, churches across town, like make that a habit, build some of those relationships cross congregationally where you can. Um, one of the things we've done as a church, like we're, it's a predominantly white church, um, but even as we think about our church planting funding, it's like, hey, are there ethnic minority churches that we can get behind that are preaching the gospel in hard places that like that won't be self-sustaining by our American church metrics? Um, like, are, are there are there people we can partner with over the long haul? Because we, we may not be as diverse as that church is, but we love what God's doing in that place. We believe in the mission God's called those people to. And like, we want to we want to get behind God's work of drawing every nation to himself. So like, if that takes if that takes some dollars out of my pocket to help bring about gospel renewal in another city, like I want in on that, too, you know. Um, so, I mean, those are, those are just a, a handful of ways. I could talk about that for a while, but those are a handful of ways. I, would, I can <laughs> Well, this is super helpful. I mean, I love the, uh, like we, we, we like participate in the identity of Jesus as the, you know, he's the incarnate one. Yes. You know, and so we, we live that out. We live out the incarnation in our relationships with each other, with our, you know, boundary breaking like behaviors mm -hmm. and, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I resonate deeply with that. Like when we did live overseas, some people were like, why on earth would you, <laughs> would you have left America to come here? You know, mm -hmm. and it, there's a miraculous thing that's at work. I think yeah. that's, you know, that's the heart of it. And so, Man, well, yeah, well, that's the thing is like, if, uh, I mean, what, cause what you guys did when you, when you, when you went overseas is like, if Habakkuk two uh, promises, if we see in Isaiah as well, like, not a day is coming that the knowledge of the glory of God is going to cover the whole earth like waters cover the sea and like yeah. disciples of Jesus say well if that's what God's doing I want in on that so it's like that's why we go to the nations like the spirit of God provokes like I want in on that movement and if the spirit of God is awakening a joy that every tribe tongue and nation will like I want to be a part of that now like I want to get a taste of it now because um like I long for heaven man like I long yeah. for that day um, and wherever I can get a taste of what it's going to be like in relationships. And in, in, I mean, like, even think about it, this is an experience you've had to hear someone praising Jesus in their native tongue, different from yours, mm -hmm. is a really powerful to hear, have someone pray over you in their native tongue is really powerful to have someone sing in, even in the same language, but of a different cultural note and a cultural experience from you. It's like a blessing and a gift from God. Like, Absolutely. I want every, I want every bit of that, man. Like, and it's it's also humbling and decentering, right? Yes, absolutely. So it, it carries with it the glory of God, which decenters, absolutely. you know. And you recognize how big God is. Yes, you know. Yes, I mean, if He knows every language in the world, you know, and He's equally fluent in all yes. of them, yes. <laughs> you know, then it changes the way you you view him but also changes the way you view his church absolutely well. yeah absolutely. so that's man thank you so much brian your yeah, brother. your words your voice everything i mean is is really helpful for us and i you know i pray that we would be formed into a united people Amen. you know from Amen. every tribe and tongue kin and nation you know yes. so thank you thank you for yeah, aiding brother. us in that yeah absolutely brian. Right, man. yeah take care yep